start please okay thank you ma'am so very good afternoon to all of you i dr gauri jerath welcome you all in the afternoon session of day 14 of 21 day winter school so today we have with us dr ajayta riyaluch working as scientist in veterinary parasitology at icr ivri regional station palampur so i welcome you dr sir we truly appreciate the valuable time and knowledge you have dedicated to this 21 day winter school so before you proceed i would like to take a moment to introduce you to our participants so dr ajayta riyaluch is a bvsc and ah graduate from dgcn college of veterinary and animal sciences csk hvkv palampur she pursued her mvsc from gb panth university of agriculture and technology and phd from icr ivri izzat nagar in discipline of veterinary parasitology she has a career spanning over 7 years and her post phd journey has been marked by various roles in veterinary profession starting from a veterinary officer in hp state department of animal husbandry then as an assistant professor at dgcn college of veterinary and animal sciences palampur and later as an ars scientist in icr so dr ajayta a dedicated researcher has focused on crucial livestock parasitic disease such as bovine cryptosporidiosis cystic echinococcus and tick infestation and various git parasites her scholarly contributions extend to 21 peer reviewed research articles two edited books seven book chapters and 23 technical or popular articles she got recognitions for her outstanding work include dr jp dubey young scientist award in 2012 from the indian association for advancement of veterinary parasitology she has also been honored with a certificate of appreciation for her in invaluable contributions as a member of corona warrior team of icr ivri mukteshwar campus for covid-19 testing recently in 2022 she received women scientist award by society for scientific development in agriculture and technology additionally she has secured six best oral poster presentation awards at various national international conferences organized by professional or scientific societies so once again i extend my warm welcome to you dr ajayta and now i kindly invite you to deliver your insightful lecture over to you dr ajayta thank you thank you dr gauri for this wonderful introduction and uh, good afternoon to all the participants now my if you look at the title of my today's topic like uh, these days in many winter schools or these type of um, professional uh, lectures many of the speakers they talk about the sustainability of the agriculture or the allied sector so today i'll be talking about the sustainability in the livestock production with respect to one of the health aspect and particularly with respect to the management of livestock helminth parasitic diseases so the so my topic for the presentation is integrated worm management for sustainable livestock production to begin with the helminth parasites as we know they are a major constraint in the economic livestock production and right now the current or the conventional control strategy to control these helminth parasites is the use of drugs that is enthelmintics now these drugs they have effectively controlled these helminth parasitic diseases from last several decades but single reliability on these enthelmintics is and there's uh, and the sustainability of uh, this technique is questionable because nowadays there are many farms where we can see that many of the helminth parasites they are now ir irresponsive to the treatment of these uh enthelmintic drugs not just to one class of drug but to a various group of drugs sometimes uh, simultaneously two three or um, many group of enthelmintic drugs now the major group of parasites which have developed this irresponsiveness are the gastrointestinal nematodes so my presentation will be focusing on these parasites that is the gastrointestinal nematodes and that two of the small ruminants now this drug ineffectiveness 
together with the slacking rate of the newer drug discovery and nowadays there is increasing consumer concern regarding the clean and green animal products all these things have led to the need of integrated worm control programs okay now before i jump into the integrated worm control strategies here is the list of parasites about which i'll be talking throughout my presentation so these are the gastrointestinal nematodes of small ruminants enlisted here and among these, Hemonchus contortus is the one which is of utmost importance because of its biology, its pathology, or its economic impact. So what is integrated worm management? So it refers to a system where we will utilize the multiple approaches together for the control of worms. And these multiple approaches, they are based on the consideration of economic factors the epidemiology of the parasites, the drug resistance status, the productivity system, and the management structure. So here we won't rely on a single technique as we are doing in a conventional method. So what we will be doing, one thing is one thing is there that we are not omitting the use of enthalmetics or the use of drugs because the drugs are the only thing which are capable of eliminating this worm population up to 90 to 95% of the extent whenever we are utilizing them. So the use of enthalmetics will remain as a mainstay of this integrated worm management program and to minimize the use of drugs or to maintain the efficacy of the currently available drugs, we will be utilizing other strategies along with them so that we can get the better results and we can get the sustainable production system. Now, what are these techniques or how we will implement them? I'll take them one by one. So first and foremost is the use of enthalmetics. So the, so the first component in the integrated worm management program is the use of enthalmetics. We are already doing it. We are already using them. There are several group of drugs among which there are many drugs which are used at a particular dose rate. And we are effectively managing the parasites in many parts of the world or India with these drugs. But when we are using these drugs irrationally or indiscriminately, then the result will be the enthalmetic resistance. Now, what is enthalmetic resistance? By definition, it is when a greater frequency of individuals in a parasite population, which is usually affected by a dose of concentration of the compound, will no longer be affected, or a greater concentration of drug is required to reach a certain level of efficacy. Say, for example, we are using, I'm using fenbendazole at a dose rate of 10 mg per kg body weight in goats to eliminate these gastrointestinal nematodes. Now, the same concentration when I'm using over a period of time, the parasites, they will not be eliminated or they will not be killed by that drug. When this situation comes, then the enthalmetic resistance has arrived or inherited. Now, to better understand the picture, uh, this uh, diagram, it is taken from a review, uh, as mentioned from these authors. So in a population, in a worm population, normally there are resistant worms, which are depicted here as white. And there is a very small proportion of, uh, there are susceptible worms as depicted in white, and there is a very few proportion of drug resistant worms. Now, these drug resistant worms, they normally exist in any worm population, but their frequency or their proportion is very less. So that whenever we are giving a drug treatment to this population, whatever worms they will survive, they won't hamper the animal production and they won't, they will be very, very like sub, they will remain there in a subclinical form and they won't cause the economic losses. But if the same class of drug is used repeatedly against a worm population, then over a period of time, what will happen? That drug will eliminate the susceptible worms. And finally, we will be left with the drug resistant worms. So we can say that enthalmetic resistance is a is an inevitable consequence of antiparasitic therapy. We cannot avoid it. OK, 
okay but we can manage it like we can use the drugs judiciously so as to maintain their efficacy for a prolonged time and we can employ the our worm control strategies in a strat worm control program in a strategic way so as to uh, decrease the selection pressure against these worms now when actually we started report when actually the reporting of enthalmintic resistance started it is way long back say for example the benzimidazoles they were introduced in the market or in the field in 1960s and it was in 1964 only that the first report of resistance against benzimidazole was reported from usa and from india it was reported in 1976 so as i told it is inevitable consequence if we won't use the drugs judiciously or rationally then we will encounter enthalmintic resistance now what are the factors which are contributing to the resistance development first one is the treatment frequency because with every treatment we are posing a selection pressure so as many frequent our treatments will be the as many chances are that the resistance will develop faster second one is the use of enthalmintics in a suboptimal dose now the suboptimal doses they actually help the heterozygous individuals in the population to survive and these heterozygous individuals throughout the generations they will finally convert into the resistant homozygous resistant ones then another factor is the single drug regimes like we are using same class of drug repeatedly on the pop, on the same population and then again the resistance the de development of resistance will be faster so as of now as we all know the newer drug discovery procedure is very tedious and it is very time taking and it is not that much easy to come up with the new drugs so we need to maintain the efficacy of the existing drugs and for that whenever we are administering a drug or enthalmintic in the population we need to administer it with some with consideration of some key points and the first and foremost key point is to consider the parasite biology and epidemiology when i talk about the parasite biology uh, this picture is from the article by aduci and it is a recent review article so uh, for a quick review the parasites which about which i am talking are the parasites which are having direct life cycle the adults are there in the gi system then the eggs are excreted out in the feces these eggs they hatch in the environment and develop from l1 l2 to l3 where l3 is the infective stage which is ingested by the host and it will molt twice in the body and develop finally to the adults so if we are having the technical know how of the this parasite biology like say for example when the number of eggs when there will be the maximum number of eggs excreted in the environment when it happens say for example when there will be the most worm load or when there will be the highest stocking density of the host in the um, in a particular region now these eggs now they are they are development into larvae and their survival as a larvae in the environment um, it is favored by say, say for example when there is environmental temperature around 22 to 25 degrees celsius and there is a relative humidity about 50 to 60 degrees celsius then we can say okay this is the most conducive condition so whatever eggs they are in the environment they will finally develop into l3 and these l3 will be surely available for the host to be ingested and they will surely develop into adults now inside the host also there are some physiological phenomenon of the um, parasite i can say uh, which are uh, uh, which are there and which will affect the parasitic load say for example hypobiosis it is a phenomenon very commonly associated with hemongous contortus and where there is temporary cessation of the nematode development at a particular phase of its parasitic life cycle so here the hemonchus when they when the l3 they are ingested at l4 stage they they do have the arrested development based on the 
stress conditions or unfavorable conditions. And when the favorable conditions, they come back, then these L4, they develop into the normal egg-laying adults. Now, these egg-laying adults, then they will, uh, they will be laying the eggs and they will be posing threat um, because they will be increasing the parasitic load. Now, another condition is the periparturian rise where around lambing or in the lactation period, there will be increased egg laying from the females. And these increased eggs, they are actually uh, exposed to the uh, newly born lambs and all, and they will get the infection. So we can, we can have the idea from the parasite biology, like what are the periods when there is the utmost importance of enthalmintic treatment. And we can guide our enthalmintic administration in such a way. So it will just give a hint that parasite biology, we can get the hint like when to administer the enthalmintics so that treatment frequency, like instead of giving three or four treatments a year, we can reduce our treatment frequency to one to two years. But to precisely predict like what is the time, what is the actual time when we can, we should give the drug, we need to know the parasite epidemiology and it for studying the parasite epidemiology, we need to work or we need to study that parasite population throughout the years. Like we need to study the parasite population or its incidence or incidence pattern throughout the seasons, throughout the years. And based on that, we will develop some prediction programs. So many workers in ICR system or in state agricultural universities, they have already studied the parasite epidemiology throughout the years and they have developed the region specific bioclimatographs. So here, this bioclimatograph is developed by NDVSU Jabalpur. So what we do in bioclimatographs, we study the incidence pattern of these worms throughout the, throughout the years or throughout the seasons. And we plot them against either maximum temperature or minimum temperature. We plot this temperature against total rainfall or total relative humidity for the 12 months we join these points and make a close curve and then this graph is superimposed by the climatic conditions which are most conducive for the survival of these pre-parasitic stages so wherever this will superimpose like these are the months when the parasitic load will be maximum or at its peak in the environment and when we need to do the enthalmintic intervention Another thing is a software developed by the people working at CHWRI of Ikanagar, Dr. C. Swarnkar and Dr. Dhirendra Singh, that is Frojin, which is forecasting for Rajasthan on ovine gastrointestinal hematodiasis. What they have done, they have developed a computer-based program based on these climatic variations. They are precisely forecasting the magnitude of parasitism for the next 60 days. So two months prior, they are just forecasting and it will be helpful for them to organize the deworming camps, if any, if they want to. And when they have implemented this software, this program in the state of Rajasthan, they have found 70 to 80 percent similarity in the predicted and observed intensity of the strong island infection in sheep flocks of Rajasthan. So. The another thing, there are many ways which we can employ to delay the development of enthalmintic resistance. The first and foremost concept or strategy is to maintain the population in refugia. Now, in refugia, population is the one which is not exposed to the drug treatment. So let me explain this thing with this very beautiful diagram which was published in a review article by Abbott in 2007. So when we are giving a drug treatment to an animal, inside the animal, as I told, there will be a susceptible population and very less extent of resistant population. So by treatment, we are supposed to destroy the susceptible population, only the resistant population will remain. But Simultaneously, the stages which are present in the environment, like the eggs or the pre-parasitic stages L1, L2, L3, along with the parasitic stages in those animals which are not treated, they are contributing to the in-refugia population. 
So when this these resistant worm proportion, they are coming out of these treated animals, they will mix up with these this population. So here again, there will be a large chunk of resistant population and a susceptible population and the resistant population will be diluted. So in total, after the treatment also, the parasite population will be comprising of large number of susceptible worms that will be contributing to the clinical science and all and the resistant worm population will be less. So when we are maintaining the population in refugia, the drug efficacy will be maintained for a prolonged period of time. Now, the second concept is the combination drug therapy or rotational use of drugs. A single drug, when used over a period of times, what will happen? After many treatments, at the end, we will be left with only those worms that have survived the treatment. So here, say, for example, we are having green colored susceptible worms. We are having blue colored drug A resistant worms purple colored drug B resistant worms and the red colored drug A and B resistant worms. So if we look at these pictures, which are from the experimental data from this paper. So when they have given drug A, then they found that approximately 16 million eggs were excreted. When they have given drug B, then they found that 2 million eggs were excreted after the treatment. But when they have combined these two drugs, only 0.6 million eggs were excreted. So the proportion of worms which survived the treatment of a combination therapy or when we are rotating the drugs, then also the, the proportion of worms which will survive will be less. So in a long term, it will maintain the efficacy of the drugs for a longer period of time. Then another concept is the target selective treatment. Like say, for example, we are having 100 animals in a flock. We are not going to deworm all the 100 animals because it is actually, um, the paras as per the parasite biology, mostly 70 to 80% of the worms, they reside in the 20% of the most susceptible individuals. So we need to identify those individuals. So what are the strategies to identify them? First one is the five point check. Here we consider five areas of the animals. Like if we don't want to perform the testing of the parasite under microscope or we are not going to consult the EPG, first and foremost thing is consultation of the EPG is the best method. Like we need to check that whether how much is the parasite load and depending upon the parasite load we are selecting that okay these 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 are the animals which are having a parasite load above the threshold of the clinical signs or clinical symptoms then we will uh, we will um, treat those animals but another thing is that like if we are not having the facilities especially at the farmers and to check the uh, EPG load, egg per gram load, then we can do, then we can uh, employ this five point check. Here we will look the eyes for anemia, especially for hemonchus contortus, then the back for the body condition, then the tail for swelling with the diarrhea feces, then the coat for appearance or for roughness, then the jaws for swelling, like there will be bottle jaw in case of hypoproteinemia or in case of blood loss, which is encountered mostly in hemonchus contortus and other blood sucking parasites. So those animals which are having low scores at all these five points, they will be selected and we are selectively treating these animals only. So when we are employing the target selective treatment, the first advantage is the farmer is saving the money because there will be decreased number of treatments, decreased use of drug. And second thing is it helps in lessening or decreasing the selection pressure and it helps to maintain the refugia at a larger extent. Now, another technique which is employed for the selection of the animals which need treatment is famacha. Famacha is a colored laminated chart with a five point check. It was developed by the workers uh, working in South Africa and it has been adopted in many countries and uh, by full form it is Fafa Milan chart. So there are one, two, three, four, five points. So this chart is actually used as a reference 
to check the color of the ocular mucous membrane and to know its anemia status. Say, for example, this first point, it is red, so it is non-anemic, no dose is required. And this fifth is the white, it is severely anemic and it is it requires the treatment. So it is designed only for hemonchus contortus. And, um, but in, in our country, like where we do have many minerals deficient in our soil and we do have nutritional causes of anemia, here this chart is not that much accepted acceptable and moreover our population is not just comprising of hemonchus there are many other worms also which are not blood sucking parasites but they do have other pathogenic effects but still this chart has been used as a reference especially in south africa south america and in many parts of the world so up till now till here what i was talking about the first component of the integrated worm management, that is the use of drugs, how judiciously we can employ these drugs, how we can maintain the efficacy of the drugs and all. Now, there are other components of the integrated parasite management, and these are called as alternate control strategies, which we can employ along with the use of drugs to maintain their efficacy and to design a sustainable control program. So the second component of IPC is grazing management practices. Now, if I talk about the Indian scenario, we do not have the cultivated grasslands, but we do have grazing areas uh, which are natural and uh, their availability uh, is, vari is variable from in different parts of the country and it varies along with the season. Like if I talk about the small ruminant husbandry, it can be either sedentary, like in organized farms, or it can be in a migratory system or in the farmer's flocks. Like in Himachal, we are having the Gaddi migratory flocks. Now these small ruminant flocks, they can, their grazing practices can be generalized into like either they will be grazing on harvested fields or in forest areas or in community grazing lands or uh, along the roadsides or on hilltops or in the natural rangelands or wastelands or in crop, crop stubbles, etc. It depends from region to region, it varies, but we can still generalize it. Now, the concept behind the grazing management practices is again the thorough knowledge of epidemiology, because in grazing management practices, what we are doing, whatever, whatever, is the um, whatever pasture larval burden is there we are act in in the grazing management practices we are minimizing the incidence of the larvae to be ingested by the host now either we will minimize the pasture larval burden or whenever the pasture larval burden will be high we will take out our host from from that grazing area so that the host will not encounter those larvae or host will not uh, encounter the infection. So there are some important facts about the pasture larval burden, like the eggs, they are excreted out in the feces. If we talk from the feces horizontally to what extent the larvae will move, they will not move any further than 30 centimeter away. So when we are allowing our uh, livestock to graze in a field and when the stocking density is optimum because animals if they get grasses in abundance then they frequently avoid to graze in the areas where there is feces but when the stocking density is very high then they have to graze in the areas around or near the feces or in a radius of 30 centimeter and they will encounter the infection and if we talk about the vertical migration of the larvae in, along the herbage, like majority of the larvae, 50% of the larvae, they will be found in the first two centimeter of the plant from the soil. So when the herbage height is optimal, then there are very less chances of the animal that they will ingest the larvae. Then another factors which are helpful for the active migration of the larvae will be the availability of the water film. Like after rain, they will migrate more actively or in dew drops in the early morning or in late evenings, they will migrate more. Or if the fields or grasslands are irrigated, then also the migration will be more. And sunlight is something, when there is more sunlight, the larval migration will be less, then they will be geotropic. 
so that is why it is advisable that don't we do we should not allow our animals to graze in early mornings or in late evenings and this is also one of the reason that why there are the greatest number of larvae usually around winter or uh, usually around monsoon or early winter now apart from the active migration there can be a passive migration of the larvae which is monitored by the insects the earthworm birds or fungi and when we are employing the grazing of multiple species of host, say for example, if in a common grazing land, the large animals, they are grazing along with the small ruminants, then they are acting as a vacuum cleaner because these large animals, they will ingest the larvae of the small ruminants, but those larvae, they won't develop to adults or no clinical infection will happen. So they will actually be clearing the infection from the grasslands. And in any particular day, this pasture larval burden can increase from few hundreds to several thousands per hectare per day. It will depend upon the season and rate of contamination. So whatever grazing management practice we are employing, we need to take care of all these things. And based on these principles only, there are many grazing management practices like rotational grazing. We are dividing the grazing grassland into three or four parts and we are rotationally grazing our animals in that field. Safe pasture system, whenever the pasture is safe, then only we will allow them to graze. If, if the pasture is heavily contaminated, we will rest the pasture. Alternate grazing, we are mixing the different species, doze and move. It is for already grazed pastures, like whenever we are keeping our animals for grazing, or to the forest we are keeping uh, we are uh, we, we are administering the enthalmintic and then we are moving them there then animal density stocking rate i already told you how it is affecting herbage height then grazing time where the, it should be in the daytime then for the conservation techniques like hay making silage making the heat which is produced during this time it also destroys the developing larvae or zero grazing system we are not allowing the animals to graze it is in the um, organized or uh, organized farms only. So this was about the grazing management practices. Then the third component is the vaccines against gastrointestinal nematodes. It is still in infancy, though most many uh, of the workers, they have worked in this field, but we could not get much of the success. But still, we are having something like in 2014, it was Barber Vax, which was registered in Australia and later on in the name of Wirevex it was registered in South Africa. Now these two are the countries where Hemonchus contortus is uh, very much notorious and enthalmintic resistance has developed to a very very greater extent. So they have incorporated the vaccines in their regular control programs. Now what this Varvarvex comprise of or what these vaccines comprise of, they are the native cut antigens that is H11, HGAL, GP combined with the adjuvants and five subcut injections of one ml each are administered three as priming doses, three to four weeks apart, and two as boosters, six weeks apart. So these are used as an adjunct to the enthalmintic therapy to minimize their use and their effects. It was seen that they have helped to lower the EPG and pasture larval burden. And if I talk about the Indian scenario till now, they are not registered in India, but still like we have got one lead in this area and we are hopeful that in future we may get something new or something more in this field so it can be seen as a viable technology especially where the enthalmintic resistance has increased up to a very very great extent or where the hemonchus contortus has been very very challenging to control then the fourth one is the breeding for improved disease resistance. This again is in its infancy, this practice, and it I don't think so it is being practiced anywhere in the world. But it is still, we do have a concept that in a population of animals, we can practice to select those animals which do have either resistance or resilience. So there are two concepts when we are going to select the animals for improved disease resistance. First one is the resistance. Now this resistance is different from the drug resistance. This is the resistance of the host to suppress the establishment of parasites or eliminate the parasite load. Say for example, I'm having two sheep, A 
and B. A is of another species, B is of another species. I am administering 1,000 worms to both the species. Species A, all 1,000 worms, all 1,000 L3 larvae, they have developed to adults. But in species B, the 1,000 worms I have given, but only 500 could establish. So this species B is actually having a genetic resistance against the establishment of the parasite or if the parasite is established it will be eliminated from the host and another concept is resilience or tolerance now i am having two sheep both are having thousand adults inside the body first sheep is experiencing diarrhea anemia weight loss decreased production and all but the another species although it is having thousand worms but its production is still much, much better. The anemia is anemia status is better. The growth rate is better. The production levels are better. So this species is actually resilient or tolerant. So it is able to maintain a relatively undepressed production level even under the parasitic challenge. Now, already there are few breeds of these small ruminants which have been identified and which are resistant against these GI nematodes. From India, it is the Garul and Hisardale. And <laughs> sorry, some other species from other parts of the world. Now, if I consider the practicability of the genetic improvement strategies, there are still there are many practical difficulties like first one is to assess difficulty in assessing or the cost of measuring the parasite resistance and correlate the traits such as fecal account and pcv because there are many factors whenever we are rearing the animal there are many factors to what extent we will control then difficulties of estimating the heritability and genetic and phenotypic correlation with the production rates. Like, okay, the animal is resistant to the worms, but whether it is able to maintain the production, how we will correlate those factors and how we will estimate the heritability in respect to correlation, it is very, very difficult. And another difficulty is whenever we uh, encounter the superior worm resistance, it is frequently associated with the low heritability and some other complications like poor weight gain, poor growth rate or maternal abilities as we found in case of Guru. So the genetic breeding for uh, uh, genetic selection and all, it is still not in the practical or a viable stage. Now, the another intervention is nutritional intervention. This is practically very much possible, but it is very, very complex and it need a variety of considerations and strategic management because the interaction of parasite and nutritional status of animal is very, very complex. Say, for example, if there is any parasite, any GNU root or uh, as shown in this uh, figure from this paper, like when there is Haemonchus contortus infection, whenever there is parasite infection in the host, it actually affects the animal's nutritional status because the first and foremost clinical sign of any parasitic infection is the animal becomes off-fed or its feed intake is reduced because there are changes in the GI tract. Then its digestion is disturbed because the mucosa is disturbed, its pH is changed, there are blood losses, there are decreased absorption through the mucosa, and the general metabolism is also disturbed. And all these things, they lead to the production losses or subclinical signs. And at this stage, when it is subclinical, it is undiagnosed by the owner. On the other hand, these are the effects like how the worm population, they are causing the pathophysiological consequences. But, <laughs> sorry, the feed which the animal, parasite infested animal is taking, it is comprising of roughage and concentrates. Now, this roughage is actually a source of GI infection. 
because we are ingest the, the animals they are ingesting l3 along with the feed and it is a source source of plant secondary metabolites now there are some plant secondary metabolites which do have enthalmintic properties so these plant secondary metabolites they can decrease the worm population or they can have a negative effect on the worm population and at the same time these plants they also contain some plant secondary metabolites which stimulate the host re response like host immune response is stimulated and this stimulated host immune response will actually contribute to the decrease in the worm population and apart from that the feed is also comprising of or the nutrition is also comprising of the macro and micronutrients now these macro and micronutrients they do have established effects on the animals host animals response or they do have a negative effect on all these disturbed pathophysiological consequences also so it is a two way interaction and in this so many factors they are playing a role so to decide or to correlate or to formulate the strategy it need a very very strategic planning now what are the macro and micronutrients like here is the list of some minerals which are essential actually which are having a role uh, in the worm establishment or in the immunity against the gastrointestinal nematodes even the protein intake it is highly associated with the immune response against the worms the condensed tannins which are having a uh, ability to form complexes with the proteins in lower concentration they do have an effect in decreasing the egg hatching or larval worm burden or fecal egg count so in total all what i can say is say for example there is an animal which is infested with the parasite if the same animal i am keeping at the low plan of nutrition the parasite infested animal if it is at the low plan of nutrition its human function will be suboptimal and if i am providing the supplements to this animal like human degradable proteins or energy or locally available feeds at low price then its resilience power will increase its famacha spore will increase its growth milk production etc will increase if the animal is already at the good plan of nutrition then very few feed supplements we suggest like human escape proteins we will increase the protein concentration of the diet still its resilience power will increase its famacha score will increase and it will require very less enthalmintic intervention here the animals which were at the low plan of nutrition when we are supplementing it if we are giving say for example three or four treatments the treatment frequency will reduce and here the animals which are already at the good plan of nutrition if we are supplementing again then the treatment still very less street treatment is required but the animals which are at the excellent plan of nutrition they are the ones which are the most resilient no further improvement like no further supplementation is required for them and we already expect them to be resilient to tolerate the parasitic infestation and when they are capable of tolerating the parasitic infestation then enthalmintic treatments are not at all required so we can manage like if we manage the nutritional plan of the animal we can manage not just the parasite load parasite burden fecal egg count or parasite um, count but we can also lower the treatment frequencies like we will give the treatment only if it is economic in the system like if we see that after the treatment also the parasite is perform the animal is performing in the same way as in the excellent plan why to give the unnecessary treatment so by incorporating the nutritional interventions we can manage the parasitic infestation also and we can manage the problem of enthalmintic resistance also now the ethno veterinary practices is another component as i told there are some plants secondary metabolites which are having uh, the enthalmintic properties there is a huge lot of literature especially from the traditional or conventional medicine here is the list of few plants there are hundreds of plants which which are uh, expected to show enthalmintic property but their clinical efficacy clinical trials are still need to be done and uh, we need to take a lead in this area but till now there are like i don't think so there are much herbal formulations which are there in the market for enthalmintic for uh, nematode control 
Now the another one is the biological control. So what we are doing here in this, like nematodes, there are free living stages of the nematodes. Those free living stages, we are targeting them with the help of biological enemies. So these biological enemies, they can be either the some uh, kinds of fungi like predaceous fungi like Arthrobotrys, Oligospora, Monacrosporium, Tudingtonia flagrans, then endoparasitic predaceous fungi they will be trapping. They will be trapping or they will predate the free living nematode stages. Endoparasitic fungi they will invade inside the parasite and they will kill it or they will destroy it. So there are some species which have been reported an egg parasitic fungi, they will be the parasite of the egg stage of the parasite. Then there can be some bacteria like Bacillus thuringiensis, which can be employed for the biological control. And in India, uh, there are two species that is Arthrobotrys oligospora and Dodictonia flagrans. They have been isolated from the people working at Dur, that is Dr. P. Sanyal. And he has uh, done some controlled experiments and he has found very promising results. But there are some practical issues with the commercial availability of these fungal species as a viable control method because the time of spore administration, the way how we are administering the spore, they are very, very crucial and it is far, far away from the commercial reality till now. So this was all about the different techniques which we can employ for the integrated parasite management. So I conclude my talk here. All the stakeholders of the livestock sector, whether it is a farmer, but whether it is a veterinarian, whether it is a pharmaceutical industry or a researcher or academician, all of them, they have realized that the time of easy parasite control based on only the use of enthalmintic is over. And sustainable worm control program will have to rely on the combination of strategies and not just on a single chemical control method. And optimum use of drugs, judicious and rational use of drugs is very much essential to maintain the efficacy of the enthalmintics. Now, we need to monitor the efficacy of these enthalmintics. There are different tests to monitor this, and that should also be done on a regular basis. And successful policies should be formulated based on the sound evidence, considering the probable mismatch between the realistic world and unrealistic expectations from the available technologies and their potential adoption in the developing countries. Now, it was rightly said by Armando Nari that it is impossible to prepare a standardized control strategy that is applicable to all situations. A preferred approach is to thoroughly analyze the situation and apply the best bet option effectively. Thank you. So I conclude my talk here. Thank you, Dr. Jaita. It was really an elaborative one. And uh, you have uh, very well uh, discussed the integrated pest management. Uh, so uh, integrated uh, nematodes management. So uh, it's time to take the queries. So I request all the participants, either you can directly talk to Dr. Ajayata for your uh, addressing your queries, or you can write in the chat box. So I request you to please. Uh, one uh, person has raised the hand that uh, Dr. Long Kumar. Do you have any query, doctor? Dr. Rongsi? I think it is by mistake. Uh, maybe. I request again, please uh, write in the chat box if you have any query. Okay, so herbal therapy in case of management of helminth parasites in animal? Um, I don't think so. Right now, it is not available. Like people, they are practicing uh, traditional medicine, like what we say, uh, ITKs. 
they are doing okay they are using many uh, several herbs in in different different tribes or in different different areas there are some local plants and herbages which the people are using and they are practicing also but if i say that okay it is uh, available in market then i don't think so it is available Dr. Deepak, do you have any query? Yes, ma'am, I, I have one. 